Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you here for this, our 32nd episode of This is CDR. Um, uh, my name is Toby Bryce. Uh, I work on CDR policy advocacy with Open Air, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, everyone, if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. This is CDR is an online event series to explore the wide range of CDR solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals we're advancing as Open Air in New York and a number of other U.S. states, as well as uh, in the EU and Ireland and um, other jurisdictions worldwide. If you're not familiar with Open Air, we're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions that are essential to solving the climate crisis. Um, we're a global community um, growing quickly, and we collaborate on shared open source missions in the area, uh, areas of policy advocacy, R&D, and um, CDR market development. Um, there should be a link in the chat to join our group, and we'd love to have you. There's plenty of uh, interesting and fun projects to work on, so uh, please check it out. Before we start, just uh, many of you will be aware of this, but quick background on carbon removal. And uh, first of all, the definition, which is the, from the CDR primer and also the pretty much the same definition that the IPCC uses. Um, carbon removal consists of anthropogenic activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and to durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. A couple important things when we're talking about CDR. First of all, <clears throat> carbon removal is in no way any um, sort of replacement uh, for reducing emissions. We need, need to decarbonize the global economy and reduce global emissions as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, every um, credible climate forecast and there's clear scientific consensus that carbon removal will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century. Um, that's billions of tons per year. And it's really important that we start working to uh, scale durable carbon removal now. Number two, um, carbon removal is often conflated uh, in, in the media and elsewhere with carbon capture, which is uh, typically means to capture CO2 from a point source emission. Um, that's a form of emissions reduction and it may or may not have a role to play in the, our larger time at climate toolkit, but it's not carbon removal. So it's really important to make sure that we're talking about carbon removal, which is again, removing CO2 from the atmosphere and durably storing it. We'll put some resources in the chat. Um, if you wanna learn more about carbon removal, there's a little logo in the right corner of the slide. The CDR primer is a great place to start. Um, there's some great DOE, uh, Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management resources. This series, we now have 32 episodes that we can learn a lot about different CDR pathways and methods. Um, so lots of resources and ways online to learn more about carbon removal. I'm gonna hand it over now to my um, co-host, Mega Raghavan, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about the run of show and introduce today's session. Hey everyone, I'm Mega. I'm an Open Air member in London uh, and working on some policy opportunities in California for CDR, which is where I'm from. Um, as usual, our format is going to be a 15 to 20 minute presentation, followed by a few prepared questions, and then we'll have moderated audience Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and Zoom as we go along. Um, just make sure you find the one that says Q&A, not chat. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send the video link to everyone who registered, and we'll also post to Open Air's website and to our YouTube channel. Um, we'll also be live tweeting the event, so we'll put the Twitter link in the chat, and please follow along with that. If you tweet, the event hashtag is hashtag this is CDR. Um, and this week on This is CDR, we're very happy to welcome Takachar co-founder and CTO Kevin Kung to tell us about the company's Earthshock Prize winning modular distributed thermochemical process for converting waste biomass into biochar and other valuable materials. Um, Kevin is the co-founder and the CTO of Takachar, and from 2012 to 2017, he built Takachar's initial technology as part of his PhD research um, in the field of biofuels and renewable energy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. Uh, with the support of the Tata Trust. Prior to that, Kevin had six years of experience conducting en engineering design in resource constrained settings, including borehole restoration in Uganda, interlocking stabilized construction materials in Ghana, and renewable energy systems in both Kenya and India. Um, in 2015, Kevin co-founded a company called Safi Organics in Kenya, which produces carbon negative high yield biochar fertilizer from crop residues um, and which improves smallholder farms, farmers uh, harvest yields by 30 percent. Um, he also helped grow the company to 25 full time employees and 5,500 customers. Uh, so, Kevin, over to you when you're ready. Yeah, thanks so much, Mega, for the um, introduction. Really honored and um, happy to be here today to share some of our work. 
Yeah, thanks so much um, for tuning in. Uh, my name is Kevin, and uh, I'm the CTO of Takachar. And so I, I grew up in uh, in Taiwan, where right ne right next to a rice field, actually. And one thing that um, really is stuck in my childhood memory is um, after harvest, sort of the smell of farmers burning the uh, crop stubbles, um, which is not really a bad smell and something that still evokes uh, pretty strong nostalgic memories today. Uh, when I moved to North America, a lot of that um, sort of faded from memory until in recent years, um, where, um, as some of you may know, due to some of the increasingly catastrophic wildfires, um, it does tend to pollute uh, the, the Western states, um, especially during the summer months. This is a photo taken actually outside of um, also where I was um, in September 2020 at 10 a.m. Pacific time. So this really prompted me to start uh, thinking harder and working on this um, because this is not sort of the nostalgic memory that I wanted um, my children to have. So um, a lot of the um, kind of the, the, this uh, air pollution is uh, attributed to uh, kind of the burning, uh, open air burning of crop and forest residues, which often we call biomass. Uh, even though uh, those same residues are often um, sort of renewable, potentially renewable feedstocks uh, for higher value materials ranging from biofuels to chemicals to, um, to fertilizer, kind of biotrop-based fertilizers. And the catch is that most of the current large-scale technologies um, are kind of very capital intensive and centralized, which means that these residues must first be uh, collected. And collecting this uh, loose, wet and bulky biomass is often very um, kind of um, expensive as well as logistically complicated. And as such, most rural communities are often shut out uh, from the emerging uh, bioeconomy. And the only recourse is to uh, burn their residues on site, um, which is essentially contributing to um, a lot of that urban smog. And even in the West Coast, I mean, a lot of that uh, open air burning also takes the form of uh, sort of the slash piles of non merchantable residues uh, that are left over after um, forestry management or timber harvest, um, some of which is to prevent uh, the wildfires. So what Takachar is working on are small scale low cost portable systems that can latch onto the back of tractors and pickup trucks, and that can deploy to rural hard to access regions to locally upgrade and densify the residues on site into higher value bioproducts, such as uh, biochar based fertilizer, biofuels or chemicals. And that for the purpose of the uh, CTR talk today, the most, I guess, the most relevant um, output, uh, which I'll be focusing on is the biochar uh, based soil amendment and fertilizer. And this, I mean, is something which we've developed and requiring no external energy and fuel to run itself and um, can actually customize the uh, output products. So the science behind this is that of a thermochemical treatment, which some of you may already be familiar with, uh, whereby raw biomass, when you, gen I mean, when you treat it to moderate heat, it releases low energy molecules, which we can capture and um, oxidize and use the heat to run the whole process, which requires no additional energy and fuel input uh, beyond what's being extracted uh, from the biomass. And uh, subsequently, the biomass densifies into something that's more carbon rich um, and also more recalcitrant and uh, also improved uh, qualities uh, for feedstock processing. And um, so from, and also those technologies, because uh, they can oxidize a lot of the, um, the off gas, um, eventually when we compare something like this to the status quo, which is open air burning, uh, what we found, at least on a lab scale, is that uh, you can reduce a lot of criteria pollutants, such as PM 2.5, uh, CO, NOx, and SOx even, um, by 95, and in some cases up to 98%. Um, here is really just showing you a visual uh, verification of that. To the left side is sort of the status quo, kind of the baseline conversion uh, in kind of a uh, open air burning process. And on the right hand side is what uh, the lab scale technology uh, of ours uh, is able to achieve. So um, the technology is very simple. Uh, it's based on the idea of um, moving bed reactor, right? Where biomass sort of is fed and moves down by gravity and is continuously removed. Um, and sort of, I mean, when it's reacted, 
and we inject air at the bottom, which is sort of the oxygen link process uh, to keep the reaction going in the reaction zone. So uh, during my PhD work at MIT, we were able to show that um, number one is that we can operate that this is not a runaway reaction, right? So, I mean, we can essentially keep everything at steady state and run it for many hours in a stable controlled way. And furthermore, by adjusting how much air to biomass, we can um, adjust the temperature. And by adjusting how quickly we remove the biomass, we can adjust the uh, residence time. And from that, uh, that is actually an indication that we can actually um, potentially customize um, the output carbon-based product, um, whether you are talking about electrical conductivity here as shown, or um, porosity, or pH, or uh, calorific value as a function of uh, how we run a reactor. And we also were able to demonstrate that uh, we could um, process different types of input feedstocks, uh, ranging from rice husks to almond shells, even to coconut shells um, and wood chips uh, without changing the hardware configuration. The only thing that we need to change is essentially the reaction uh, condition. So this, I mean, really opens up uh, sort of, um, I guess, an um, updated vision of how we envision this uh, bioprocess to be. And the idea is that a lot of the biomass is very um, context dependent, right? I mean, it's, I mean, depending on whether the, the weather condition, uh, the specific types, and also their particle sizes and how they are collected and harvested. So uh, we, if we have a fleet of reactor that's able to automatically sense the input feedstock, um, and uh, at the same time, if we know um, in a local community, what are some of the output um, product uh, kind of market demand uh, at a specific time, point in time, then we can actually customize the reactor sort of remotely and do, I mean, essentially do the conversion um, and um, essentially mix and match um, the output products to the local demand uh, in real time. So let's focus on our first use case uh, for, which is um, for biochar-based fertilizer. Um, and a lot of that um, is done in kind of smallholder agriculture and um, in collaboration with another company that I was, I mean, I've been involved with, the SAP Organics in Kenya. So to understand the context a bit better, uh, let's meet Mrs. Quasacilia. Uh, she is a smallholder um, kind of a vegetable farmer. And um, essentially, um, she pays two to five times the world price for her fertilizer because a lot of that is imported. Um, from um, centralized plants. And then uh, due to the COVID and now the international sanctions, a lot of that fertilizer is either unavailable or very, very expensive for her. Um, so what we have been able to um, kind of showcase and this pilot in this case is a biochar based fertilizer um, that also retains us, I mean, moisture and uh, chemical um, more effectively than traditional fertilized chemical fertilizer without kind of it leaching it back into the waterway, right? So what in effect uh, is that we could actually reduce some of application rate for the very expensive chemical fertilizer um, and essentially have kind of a, so what we sell is essentially a, a standalone blend uh, comprising of biochar plus um, some of the nutrient that's needed uh, to complete um, the, 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 the local nutritional gap on a farm-to-farm -farm basis called Safisardi. And what we were able to demonstrate um, is on average, uh, some of these farmers uh, at the same price that they pay for their chemical fertilizers per season per hectare, um, they're able to increase their yields on average by 27% and therefore uh, sometimes selling the excess harvest and earning more income. And uh, for Mrs. Wasacilia, this means that she became financially independent uh, from her husband. And here's what, what some of the other farmers have to say. So you probably can't hear it, he's, I mean, but you can read the subtitle, I guess.
So in terms of cost, uh, what we were able to demonstrate is actually a negative cost of carbon removal just by virtue of the selling price. Uh, because if we add up the total cost for the production, um, and uh, what we found was this was about, this is about for our uh, kind of pilot production in Kenya, about $70 per ton of CO2 removed, right? But I mean, if we actually account for just the value that we deliver to some of those farmers tilling very um, um, kind of a challenging soil, uh, it turns out that we can actually um, make revenues that actually more than offsets the cost for carbon removal. And um, there are also other, but this is not just about carbon removal. There are also significant other uh, social and environmental benefits, um, particularly in um, sort of rural underserved communities, right? One example is uh, Japheth, for example, uh, who uh, would be an um, sort of underemployed rural youth um, who would have to migrate to uh, Nairobi slum to find meaningful work. Uh, but because of um, kind of the one of these uh, pilots that we conducted in his ancestral village, um, he was able to find meaningful work, right? And essentially stay in, in the village with his family. And, and essentially um, after three years working with us uh, was able to be promoted to kind of a production manager and now is um, kind of heading to Nairobi, not so much to uh, find kind of a migrant work, but rather to get his MBA degree. And also the other uh, co-benefit is in terms of climate justice, right? And sort of many of you may know, um, biochar uh, can remove um, carbon by intercepting um, the carbon in from the nature, kind of nature-based removal from the growing plants uh, in a more recalcitrant way and putting that into the soil for hundreds of years. Um, but in our case, we also avoid additional um, carbon through kind of avoiding this open air burning as well as the transportation of kind of chemical fertilizer, which is also energy intensive to produce. And from that perspective, we do have um, nowadays a growing uh, interest in some of the, uh, uh, the carbon credits. But one of the problems with a lot of the smallholder farmers is that they are often shut out uh, from the current uh, carbon market uh, simply because it's too expensive for them to uh, to get certified, uh, especially in one acre plots. So, I mean, that's where, I mean, if we can customize and really uh, know what's going out to the farmers, then we can create something that can then allow them to verify and sort of aggregate uh, some of the carbon removal and allow uh, those payments to be um, certified and passed to them, thereby allowing these rural underserved communities access to um, kind of carbon credits uh, for the first time. So, so far we've been working with around 5,000 uh, farmers in collaboration with uh, Safi Organics and created more than 800,000 um, additional rural livelihood um, and by converting uh, around 10,000 um, tons of the, um, of the, of the um, biochar-based fertilizer. And additional impacts, I mean, if we do scale in other areas that are more fire prone, such as the West Coast would involve um, wildfire mitigation and also reduce air pollution. And indeed, that is something that we also have been exploring. Uh, so we do have a, a pilot that's set up in, uh, in Richmond, um, California, uh, where we've been working with some of the local uh, forest landowners and uh, deploying, or at least doing some initial demonstration and feasibility study on um, what some of the technology might look like uh, I mean, and could that be also uh, adapted to kind of the West Coast setting. Yeah, so I will end here. Uh, thanks so much for giving me the time and I hope you share our version of turning trash into cash and take any questions. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> that was great. And um, really, uh, I think you see in the comments, people are very inspired by what you and Takachar and Safi are doing. So um, thank you for all that. Um, you kind of covered our first question in a really evocative way in the beginning of your presentation. We always ask our guests, you know, how did they start thinking about carbon removal in the business? And your memories from Taiwan of the of the burning rice patty is is really um, a, a great great um, foundation. Can you talk a little bit about how the company has kind of when it formed and how it evolved and how it how you know you relate to both Sapi and Takachar? Just talk a little bit about the kind of the company formation and how you came when it happened and how you came to where you are today. Yeah, initially the company, I mean, we are MIT spin out, right? So initially we started as more as a public service project. Uh, I mean, we started in Kenya, that's because 
uh, that's where we in initially that that's where our roots are. And even the word uh, taka char taka is a Swahili word um, for for trash. I guess that sort of um, underscores that, uh, that 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 origin. Um, and I mean, I mean, a lot of that was I mean initially done uh, as a student project um, while I was doing my PhD work. Uh, but also in parallel on my PhD research, right? Kind of, I mean, a lot of the work around SAFI and some of the shortcomings of the technology kind of fit, sort of are fed into kind of PhD work. I mean, and really in thinking how should um, a more kind of scalable and um, a customizable technology might look, right? And that's sort of, um, sort of that dialogue between, I guess, venture building and um, kind of research that sort of um, was the initial point for Takachar. Got it. Um, so this, uh, this came up in the chat, but we haven't mentioned it verbally. Um, congratulations on being one of only 15 XPRIZE Milestone awardees, um, which were announced at the end of last week. That's just a huge accomplishment and we're very pleased. Yeah, honored. thank you. We, we are very surprised and honored as well. Um, and we're, we're very happy to have you here right after that happened. Um, you also won another major prize, uh, Prince Charles's Earth, Earthshot Prize, um, towards the end of last year. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the effect and the impact those prizes have had on your company? And more generally, how you see prizes like that helping to um, uh, accelerate and provide market development for carbon removal overall? Yeah, I think both both are very high profile and um, a kind of very high profile price, right? So I think obviously the money goes a long way in uh, in kind of scaling some of the work and uh, the risking um, things, both on the technical as well as the business side. Uh, but more importantly, I think is the network that they enabled us to connect with. Um, I mean, essentially after Earthshot as well as X Price, we got inundated by kind of just interest right in the area, right? And I think it's uh, it's it's really encouraging to see um, sort of, I mean, at least some, some of the issues that we care a lot about, for example, kind of uh, rural kind of um, crop residue burning and uh, in the case of Earthshot and kind of working with rural smallholder farmers in the case of XPRIZE receive uh, so much uh, attention because th those are, we think, really important and sometimes potentially um, um, kind of uh, underlooked topics. Yep, yep. Um, again, that's really great and congratulations. <clears throat> um, we mentioned earlier at the top of the show that one of the reasons we're doing this series is that Open Air is working on a number of different carbon removal um, policies. One of them is a, a state level policy framework in the US uh, called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act. And it's basically a way to get states and other potentially other jurisdictions to start um, buying carbon removal as part of their overall climate policy to provide market support for scaling, the, you know, providing the scale of carbon removal that we're going to need to to achieve to get to gigaton scale by mid-century. Um, biochar is a big part of the sort of set of carbon removal methods um, in many states, um, including in New York, where, where um, the policy is uh, sort of originated and was currently in, in the legislature. Um, can you talk a little bit about your your um, your technology are there different sizes of the apparatus um, different throughputs like what is the throughput is there a range depending on the different sizes uh, and then also um, can it work with different feedstocks yeah so one of the big challenge uh, in biomass um, and logistics is that it's very context dependent right I think um, biochar is influenced by that right I think I mean, the kind of Filled with studies of biochar, but I mean, I mean, a lot of that is a function of the input uh, feedstock, the treatment conditions, and so forth, right? And I think um, that that is a challenge um, when it comes to a lot of those uh, standardization because um, bio, I mean, biochar is not like a one size fits all solution, right? And a lot of that um, kind of both the uh, kind of the carbon removed as well as the quality and the impacts it has um, is dependent on that, right? Mm -hmm point, I mean, in Kenya, I mean, we used to kind of fly in a blind, right? I mean, I mean, but now, I mean, now, I mean, before we even apply biochar to the soil, first we test farmer soil, right? And understand uh, what's the pH and what are the nutritional gaps, right? And based on that, we then started recommending uh, certain formulations um, of both, I mean, both the produced biochar as well as the, uh, the nutrients that should be added to that to really complete that process. Right. And, and that's a challenge. I mean, if you talk about kind of um, 
uh, verification process because I mean many of those today are kind of uh, not built to um, kind of account for that kind of a level of customization, right? So um, and 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 I think so. So that's another area I think for us we are interested in looking at a bit more is. If we go to these uh, rural communities where uh, there's a lot of things are context dependent, how can we actually, um, I mean, kind of work with the existing framework and potentially developing new ones that would meet uh, their needs and not sort of kind of fit into a one size fits all solution, which some of it may not be applicable. And, and, and I know you just said it's not one size fits all, but the, the actual, like the, the scale at which an individual module operates, can you give us a sense of that? Or if there's a range, like how many tons of biomass per unit time and like what level of carbon removal that would um, generate? Yeah, in places like Kenya and India, I mean, I mean, based on our initial experience is that one ton per day, that's the minimum eco economic scale. I mean, below that, it's not likely you are going to make any kind of meaningful um, um, kind of cash. Well, I mean, we sort of built that based on the assumption of no carbon removal pricing, right? I mean, this is all kind of just us fertilizer at a price higher than um, what it takes to produce a biochar, right? But I mean, carbon removal is on that same order, right? So I think that's the minimum scale uh, for which it works, right? And our technology definitely can scale up, right? And uh, it can scale up either by deploying a fleet or potentially by building a larger unit or potentially a mixture of both. So it does have that modularity to it. So your current current module can do order of a ton a day, and what is that? And that's is that dry biomass, and then what does that translate into in terms of removal? If you're making a sort of, I know there's no standard biochar, but a typical biochar. Yeah. So um, yeah. So with, I mean, again, it depends on the reaction condition, right? And uh, what's the desired form of biochar output? But let's take the case of our kind of. Um, Kenyan project where we mostly work with rice husks. I mean, it actually is a pretty unusual feedstock. We, we actually get about 50% yield from it, although most of that is, I mean, a lot of that is ash. Um, so from that perspective, um, we are getting probably close to um, 1,000, 2,000 tons a year of carbon removed um, in that context. Um, Though I would, I would hesitate to generalize that in different contexts. Yeah. I think that yeah. that's sort of a minimum scale. Um, so, and given that you, you know, you want your next X Prize milestone awardee, um, carbon removal and potentially participating in carbon removal markets, it sounds like that will be a part of your future business. Um, so, just a couple of questions about that. Um, how? Uh, and it sounds like it varies, but can you talk a little bit about how you think about the measurement? Um, and verification of carbon removal that your systems um, achieve? Yeah, I mean, carbon removal is something we are still learning just to just for kind of full caveat, right? Because uh, that, that's something that really we started exploring the past year or two because we started getting approached by some of those companies interested in the carbon credit, right? So um, in terms of verification, uh, that's something um, we're also still exploring, right? Um, and in, in the case of our process, right, I mean, the, the, the most obvious is that we know it's kind of the ma overall mass and energy balance of that, right? So, I mean, if we know how much biomass is going in and how much biochar is coming out and its carbon content, then we know, I mean, how much of that carbon in the, in the biomass is being retained. Um, so that's one level of uh, calculation, which, I mean, is third-party verified. And, I mean, then the question is, if that process changes, can we actually um, kind of uh, reflect that either in sort of as a QR code on a packaging of so, or some sort, uh, so that um, it's kind of it's 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 it's, um, it's indicative. Another level, which I guess is more expensive, right? But I think some people are undertaking is I mean actually looking at kind of the soil carbon content, right? Because I mean even if you put biochar into the soil. Um, there are also cascading secondary effects, right? Some of that biochar is going to be re-emitted back, uh, some fraction of that. And the, the very intervention of biochar is also going to cause um, kind of um, changes in the fluxes of other um, kind of biogenic, um, CO, I mean, both CO2 as well as other emissions on the soil. And a lot of that is not well quantified. I mean, quantified. So um, 
potentially, I mean, there's a lot of work that can be done there. I mean, kind of nuanced, to give a more nuanced answer, but that's more of a longer term kind of a view. I um, mean, just alluded to it, but how, and I'm sure this has come up when you talk to potential funders and XPRIZE, but how do you think about durability? Um, I think there are you know, a lot of different, there's at least discussion of what is the durability of biochar as a soil amendment. I mean, it might be different if you're using biochar to make concrete or something like that, but um, a more durable material. But how do you think about durability when you're using it as a fertilizer or a soil amendment? The durability of the removal. Yeah. Um, so. For us, I mean, if we think about carbon removal, then um, I mean, for that to make sense, uh, it, it, at least it should be on the order of a few hundred years, right? I mean, obviously we have not done studies on our kind of sappy organics or Takacha produced product to actually prove that it works. Um, I mean, we know some of that from the literature based on proxies uh, such as the carbon content and so forth. Um, so a lot of it's still guesswork, right? I mean, I mean, a lot of that is kind of published also in the, um, the, the existing kind of the uh, standard protocols, right? Sort of saying that, I mean, if, uh, if your kind of O2C or H2C ratio is above a certain point, I mean, I mean, it's a very kind of zero order model. Um, that's sort of what we still use right now. I mean, just for the lack of better knowledge, uh, but that's something, I mean, going back to the point of durability and also soil cover measurement, something that I think is uh, very important to, to know in the long term. Um, one last question on this topic. Um, you mentioned one of your slides and mentioned that it's you know uh, logical that in addition to removing carbon, um, the Takachar solution, um, you're you're avoiding emissions as well. If that if the non-intervention case is that the biomass would be burned, or even if it's mm -hmm. just going to decompose, um, have you like how what kind of feedback do you get from you know, not necessarily carbon markets yet, but potential funders and acquirers of your early stage removal credits. How do they think about the additional avoided emission um, or emissions reduction benefit that, that your mm -hmm. method um, offers? Yeah, so the avoided emission, I mean, if you add all of that up is, I mean, at least from our initial LCA is at least twice that of carbon removed. And, and a lot of that is actually comes from um, essentially, I mean, if you open air burn kind of biomass. I mean, sometimes you have those incomplete combustion, um, which releases like methane and so forth, which also happens, I mean, if you anaerobically, anaerobically digest um, kind of the, the slash pile and so forth. And that's a very, very powerful um, kind of a uh, greenhouse gas. And even a very small part of that, I mean, can just essentially uh, amplify because of that, um, that effect. Um, so, for us, I mean, we segregate that because, I mean, that's also just through our learning that we understand, I mean, this is sort of carbon removal is not the same as avoidance, right? But, I mean, there are some buyers who may be interested in just the avoidance, right? Potentially a lower cost and some uh, sort of more at kind of a strict kind of a carbon removal. That, that market is something we are also just in the initial stage of exploring, right? So, I mean, we segregate it just for the so, so, sort of because, I mean, just to make things a bit more rigorously rigorous for ourselves and also the way we present things, but I mean, we'll see sort of how they are being perceived. Yep. Um, great. One last question from open air. And then we have a bunch of audience questions coming. People are very excited about this topic. So that, that's great to see. Um, uh, at open air, we like to kind of geek out a little bit on the science behind the CDR methods that, that we are learning about. Um, so I just want to highlight one thing that you said in your presentation to make sure that I understand it and that everyone understands it. Um, you mentioned that your process, I believe the term is exothermic. It doesn't require any energy to engage it. One of the big problems with many carbon removal methods is the energy intensity, um, the energetics required like, are, are huge and potentially prohibitive. So I think that's a super exciting thing. And can you talk about that a little bit? And then number two, I know you didn't want to label it in the um, event right for the event, but can you talk a little bit about whether what you do is pyrolysis or torrefaction and like maybe what the difference is there, or maybe it's tuned differently for different feedstocks and, and desired byproducts. Can you just kind of give a, maybe a, a layman's quick overview of how, what you're doing relates to kind of some of those terms? Yeah. So and it is about kind of the overall energy balance. Um, so um, the way I look at this is that uh, biomass is a source of energy. 
right? So um, if you can actually extract five or 10% of that and use that heat, you can actually um, essentially use that heat to run the reaction itself without needing any, any external energy or fuel. Nonetheless, I mean, that comes at a cost of um, reduced carbon yield, right? Because the more biomass you extract as energy, the more of that goes into CO2, right? And you end up having less of the, um, of the kind of carbon yield. And for that reason, for example, sometimes people come to us with like, can you do kind of this wet vegetable waste? We were like, maybe, right? But do you really want to go into all that trouble because you will just be spending a lot of energy drying that and at the end of the day, you don't actually get that much out from that, right? So uh, a lot of that is, I mean, sort of reflected in that, right? And for, for, I mean, essentially, I mean, energy doesn't come for free, right? In this case, uh, the more energy we spend in uh, kind of either drying or uh, kind of uh, treating the, the, the biomass into biochar, the less of that comes in the form of recalcitrant carbon. And, and which I guess ties back to your other question relating what we do. I guess it's more on the thermochemical treatment spectrum, right? I mean, these terms, torrefaction is a very low temperature range and pyrolysis kind of a mid temperature range, right? And when you go to a very high temperature range, it becomes kind of a uh, gasification. Um, initially, for my PhD work, I mean, we started in the uh, kind of the torrefaction range because we were mostly looking actually at uh, solid fuel, right? That was our initial um, foray into Kenya was not so much produced biochar based fertilizer, but rather um, uh, a cooking fuel for um, for households who otherwise would cut down trees, um, often virgin wood that doesn't get planted back and, I mean, kind of char that and sort of use that charcoal for everyday cooking. Um, so, I mean, we didn't have that much luck with, um, with, uh, bioenergy solutions, unfortunately, after, I mean, a few years. So that's sort of when we st started looking at other types of carbon-based materials, including, um, including, uh, biochar. It doesn't mean that there is no future for bioenergy. In, I mean, I think a lot of that is context dependent. It just probably was that we didn't hit the right context that was, uh, suitable to support that. Got it. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Mega, are you ready to ask some audience questions? Hey, yes, uh, we have quite a few. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of technical ones, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So we had a few questions about like pre-treatment of both the feedstocks and the biochar. Um, so in general, you know, since the biochar might leach to some extent into the soil, um, how do you decide what kind of pre-treatments you need to do? What are the challenges around that? Um, anything in particular you're looking out for in terms of, you know, specific impurities? Um, what What are the considerations around that? Yeah, gee, those, those are actually a, a, above my pay grade, unfortunately. <laughs> so, I mean, our Safi Organics team, um, Samuel uh, Samuel Rigu, he he is sort of, I mean, he comes from an agronomy background and. He, he knows sort of biochar a lot better than I do. So my joke is that I know how to burn things, but I don't know how to grow things. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, I mean, going back to your questions about some of those uh, impurities and kind of potential toxic uh, pollutants, right? I think, I mean, we are aware of the EBC kind of standard, right? And that's one of the things which um, we are kind of, I mean, in the process of getting certified for, right? So um, at least that's something that's important to us and uh, we're paying attention to so because we don't want sort of the process to pollute and everything. Yeah, makes sense. And how do you go about finding those waste uh, biomass feedstocks, especially, you know, when there's potentially trade-offs where those uh, feedstocks could be used for energy or for other bioproducts? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, our initial, I mean, a lot of the times it's kind of uh, for our partners who say we have these types of feedstocks, right? And and I mean, we have potentially this kind of need. And for us, it's really just uh, initial phase, really try to understand a lot more about uh, their the day of life in their kind of world, right? And understanding what sort of things are important to them. Uh, and yeah, and sometimes that, for example, I mean, we just had a kind of a partner who said, well, can you use some of this for um, a specific feedstock? I mean, kind of, I mean, I think it was mustard some, some sort of mustard kind of a residue, right? And so we, we sort of take a look at that, right? I and mean, we may ask for some samples, right? And just start to, to look, hmm, what does this feedstock look like, right? Because, I mean, if we have some sense of that, uh, I mean, we sort of have some idea of how to uh, work with it, right? And how to treat it. 
And then we can do small scale testing, right? And to, to ensure that the process does work. So that's, I mean, again, we are still in a very early stage. So we just have a handful of pilots. So that's something we are still working out. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. We got a, a bunch of questions about sort of the economics and business model. Um, one question actually was about Puro. So the person asked, um, you know, what are the advantages for a biochar or a CDR company listing through Puro versus selling directly? Um, and I think the background is, you know, having seen them working with XPRIZE and becoming kind of the marketplace of record or trying to become the marketplace of record. Um, what kind of value proposition do you see them bringing to the table? Yeah, that's something we're also exploring and learning as well. Um, my understanding is that uh, Puro is coming, it's, it's more of a marketplace, right? So it's where uh, people can go and then even general publics, right? And, and then um, purchase uh, carbon offsets, right? And um, essentially, um, I mean, again, I have to look more carefully, but I mean, it looks like, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean a lot of that is a trade off between what buyers are willing to pay for and sort of how much. Um, work it involves, right? Because I mean, if you work with kind of a, I mean, if you work out with Pure, then essentially, I mean, you can get connected with many different um, clients. And I mean, they are not by the only platform, but I mean, platforms like them. Uh, versus if you go sort of negotiate with individual um, um, kind of companies, a lot of that is, um, that's also doable. Um, but a lot of that will depend on what a companies want in terms of, um, both the purity and the kind of the um, the um, the longevity of the carbon, right, and how much price they're willing to pay, right, and how much uh, it costs um, for the company to um, do some of that certification upfront, right. So I think, um, I mean, I mean, again, I mean, I cannot, I mean, I don't think I'm I, I'm knowledgeable enough to go into specifics, but at least on a general trade off, I mean, some of those are the considerations I would have. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, all right. Um, someone had a question specifically on the economics. So uh, you mentioned that the ne negative cost for carbon removal uh, of your process, and you also mentioned carbon credits. So could you just clarify whether the process itself um, is sort of, uh, you know, has a negative cost for carbon without the carbon credits or like just through the value of the fertilizer itself? Or is it sort of that plus the carbon credit gets you to... Um, to a positive number. Yeah, that, that's without a carbon credit. So when we built Safi Organics in 2014, this was 2015 or so, I mean, there wasn't that much of a carbon removal market, even, I mean, especially in places like Kenya, right? So um, sort of, I mean, what we found from our customers, the farmers, is that they care about the yield that the biochar-based fertilizers deliver to them, not so much about um, sort of the carbon removal aspect or kind of the environmental aspects of that, right? And that's how we develop the tech, I mean, so sort of the process and the output and cater for that, right? And that's sort of what we were able to demonstrate uh, could work, um, at least in that context, in a profitable, financially profitable way uh, without, without a, a carbon market. Yeah, okay. Um, a couple of people are asking for about some of the potential revenue streams. So one question was, uh, are you looking to license this tech to any big ag companies as one possible revenue stream? Potentially. I mean, al always open to that. Okay, cool. Um, and another one, which is a little more specific, um, was saying, you know, since biochar is so versatile and has so many different use cases, um, that person has learned from the International Biochar Initiative that biochar can actually be used to plug orphan gas wells. Um, of which there are over 3 million in the US alone and which emit methane for years after decommissioning unless plugged. Um, so are you guys familiar with that use case? And is that something you guys have considered uh, as one potential avenue? No, and we never heard of that actually. So I mean, what, what, what joy is in working in this field is you learn something new. <laughs> uh, we actually have a lot of partners who just came to us saying, hey, what about this? What about that? I mean, for, for example, adding it as an additive in some places. and. For us, I mean, our process doesn't care what to do with the end product, right? But what we need to work with some of those end applications is define sort of how that kind of the carbon-based product looks like, right? Whether that's in terms of fixed carbon content or calorific value or um, porosity or one of those metrics. And if we, if we can translate those requirements into some of those metrics, then we know how to work um, kind of our process to deliver something of that quality. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. 
Um, okay. And then a third question on a similar note was um, thinking about the device itself. Is that something you would intend to take to market on a commercial scale or as an NGO? Yeah. So, I mean, for us, I mean, Takachar itself as a for-profit company, right? We think that uh, um, there is, I mean, obviously, I mean, kind of having, um, I mean, sort of maximizing that impact is really important to us, right? And kind of, and, and sort of in a very underserved kind of a context. Um, nonetheless, I think there is, we, we think there is enough um, kind of value in the biomass uh, kind of uh, and conversion space um, combined with carbon removal and of course and others that um, that that we I think we think at least we can grow in a way that's I mean kind of self sustaining right let's put it that way mm -hmm. yeah makes sense um, just thinking about like where you guys go in the future so um, a couple of people asked what do you see as kind of the biggest challenge or barrier that is uh, in front of you guys today yeah I think um, I mean a lot of this is I mean, going to be the same with many other biomass companies that sort of have walked before us, right? I mean, biomass itself, I mean, I mean, it's, there is, I mean, sort of, I mean, it means it's a, it's a very heterogeneous kind of a feedstock, right? I mean, I think there's a level, entire level of uh, sort of processing and, and sort of kind of the uh, feedstock um, kind of characteristics that, um that essentially takes a lot of work to really understand and really understand how to work well in different contexts. I mean, even though we've worked with um, kind of things from rice husks to coconut shells to wood chips to uh, hay straws, I mean, it, we cannot guarantee that ours will work in universally with different contexts. I mean, same with biochar, right? Because, um, I mean, it, it could be that, I mean, there are certain agricultural contexts where, um, ours could make sense, right? But others um, where ours, uh, our process doesn't make sense at all. Um, so it's really figuring out where those bounds are, I think over the next year or two and demonstrate kind of a robust uh, kind of a conversion uh, capability that I think is gonna be the greatest challenge. Yeah, okay, makes sense. And then I guess on the flip side, a couple of people asking, we're asking, you know, where do you see the biggest opportunity going forward? Yeah, I think same, right? I think um, a, a lot of the cases, um, traditionally, uh, biomass tends biomass projects tends to be very large scale kind of project development style, um, kind of um, implementation, right? Which is, I mean, it's a kind of um, there's a standard kind of a way to do that. Uh, and for us, I think one of the biggest and exciting opportunities is to say, well. Can we actually, I mean, flip some of that, right? And look at this, not so much from kind of a 20 year fixed contract on sort of, I mean, million ton per, per year kind of a scale, right? But looking at something that's much more uh, kind of a small scale, almost like a, like a fleet of Uber kind of a reactors, right? And, and, and for us, I think uh, understanding, I mean, the potential for that and what are some of the, uh, I mean, how, what kind of flexibility and, uh, potentially uh, new access to um, sort of um, kind of a small scale market that this could accord. I think those are some of the more, most exciting um, uh, areas for us to explore. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, in terms of like thinking about, you know, the farmers that might actually use the biochar, um, how do you think about sort of educating them about what this is, getting them the upfront capital to potentially, you know, use the tech and actually apply it, um, education? Are you working with any local government orgs on that? Or, you know, what's the, what's the way forward on that side? Yeah, so, um, I mean, a lot of the farmers, the way we started with them is that, um, Normally, uh, it's through a local champion, right? Someone who is sort of a kind of an older, more affluent farmer, right? Who can actually take some risks and setting up initial demo plots on their on, on their farm to demonstrate that this works in a new context, right? And what we found is that the other farmers, after seeing seeing the, the results, I mean, they often sort of copies and kind of aspire to be the older older farmer. That I mean, they essentially adopt that. Kind of just uh, by word of mouth. I mean, for us, uh, once they see the benefits. Um, and regarding the technology itself, though, um, that's something. Um, 
I mean, for I mean, maybe for larger farms, it may make sense uh, to own and operate uh, on a farm level. But for smaller farms, at least in, in places where we work in Kenya, it doesn't make sense for uh, farmers to own and operate something that they are only going to use twice a year after harvest. Right. So this is something that's much more like a community scale um, um, kind of operation where uh, we work with kind of local agricultural input output kind of partners that face, I mean, sort of interface with hundreds to thousands of farmers, right? And sort of work with that network rather than uh, each farming, each farmer owning operating one. Yeah, it totally makes sense. We had a couple of people ask, um, you know, where is this going to be available? And specifically, uh, two people in India, one in Navi Mumbai, um, asking, you know, where can we learn more? And will this machine be available uh, here? Yeah, we actually have uh, our production. We, we our manufacturing facility is in Bangalore, and uh, we have uh, we have uh, we have one unit. Well, two units actually currently in Delhi, sort of the Haryana area, and two more uh, coming. Uh, one again in kind of Haryana, Punjab, and the other one in uh, in Tamil Nadu. Um, yeah, so if you are in India, um, definitely happy to. Um, explore that further we have a local team that's um sort of servicing that market just send us an email at uh info at takachar.com great and someone also asked uh what's kind of the cost that a community organization should think about if they are thinking about buying a, a device yeah so whenever we actually get approached by community partners normally we don't um even recommend that they buy our process first i mean especially if they have no experience with biochar because there are plenty of open source kind of technologies that they can start for like twenty dollars thirty dollars a piece right and they can produce batch um biochar it's it may not be the cleanest process and it may not be kind of scalable process but at least you can use that to um, do some initial trials, right, uh, on the farms, uh, because the least you want is to buy, invest in equipment, right, and just find out that, I mean, the rest of the supply chain doesn't work in that context. I mean, that's normally where we actually uh, do encourage us. I mean, if, if some partners are interested, is really do some of those, those small trials first and just figuring out uh, what are some of the needs and uh, issues within those communities uh, through these small trials, right? And if those really go well, and then um, they are looking to, to scale up. That's when I think uh, kind of continuous throughput and customizable unit uh, would make sense in, in supporting that. Yep, makes sense. Um, I'm going to ask one last question before I hand it back over to Toby to close us out. Um, so a couple of people have asked various versions of, you know, what is one thing that we as sort of interested people out there in the world can actually do to support you. And obviously, you know, open air is really interested in advocacy and citizen science. So there's like potentially people here interested in those things, but also, you know, just anyone who has kind of exciting ideas on scaling this and, you know, bringing it to other people in, in India or elsewhere in the world. Yeah, I think one thing for us is that we're always curious to learn about uh, new contexts, right? I think, I mean, we, we have um, people throughout the world, I mean, for, from the Philippines, from Indonesia, from many other countries that we don't work or know about and say, we have this partner here that works in this context. And even though we may not have the kind of the, uh, the, the capability to go there immediately, I think giving, getting those insights are critical to our work because, um, um, I mean, as we are still designing and improving and iterating um, our uh, prototype from a lab scale kind of uh, instrument to um, to kind of a full product, uh, a lot a lot of the designs are easier implemented um, if we know some of those requirements and uh, different contexts in advance, right? So, I mean, th th that's why I think I mean, by all means, re reach out to us and. Um, let, let us know about some of those uh, potential applications and use cases and always um, happy to chat more and, and, and learn about those. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. That's been super interesting for me. And I think I'm sure you've seen in the chat, uh, not just for me. Uh, I think a lot of people have learned a lot from that today. So thanks for being here. And Toby, back to you. Thank you, Mega. And um, Kevin, yeah, I want to echo Mega's thanks. And I think you saw the enthusiasm in the Q&A in the chat, just the it's really, uh, first of all, it's great to have you here after all of your recent successes and, and for such a 
uh, uh, I think a mission driven company like Takachar and Safi and, and the work that you're doing. It's so, it's really admirable. So thank you. And uh, thank you for being with us and onward. Um, good luck with everything and look forward to uh, staying in touch and watching as you scale and progress. Thank you so much. My honor to be here today and uh, take care. <laughs> the honor is ours. Um, just a couple programming notes before we uh, sign off. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, if I'm able to. Um, first of all, we have a couple of um, uh, non, uh, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong tab. Um, we have a couple of non, uh, this is CDR events that are, that are um, coming up. Um, tomorrow afternoon, we have a, a community event to talk about um, a couple of the open source hardware projects we have ongoing at OpenAir. So we'll have OpenAir members talking about Violet, Cyan, which are two different um, open source direct air capture concepts, and then a very interesting and cool um, carbon-based 3D printing mission that, uh, that we're launching. So please uh, join us for those. There'll be a registration link in the chat. Um, next week, next Wednesday on May 4th, um, Mega, um, my co-host here, has uh, organized and will be co-hosting uh, uh, an event to talk about carbon removal and frontline communities. And we have a great um, roster, a great panel that will be joining us and um, kind of a change of pace, but like we really do think it's important to think about environmental justice, both at the local level and also globally, um, given the fact that the North is responsible for 99% of our climate problem. So please join us for that. And then from a This Is CDR perspective, next week we have a company based in Oslo, um, Norway, called Inherit Carbon Solutions. And they are basically a project development company that helps um, anaerobic digestion processes, biogas, um, waste, waste treatment, and others capture the CO2 that those processes emit and then securely, um, typically geologically store it. May 10th, we have another um, XPRIZE milestone awardee, Mission Zero, which is a UK-based uh, electrochemical DAC company, um, and they're going to be deploying in, uh, in um, Oman uh, via an initiative called Project Hajar with uh, 4401, so that's going to be super interesting and exciting. Um, Dr. Nicholas Chadwick, who's the CEO and co-founder, will be presenting on May 10th. May 17th, we have a hero of open air, Dr. Greg Nemet, and he's going to talk about how solar came down the cost curve and how that can have implications for how carbon removal can and will come down the cost curve. So a couple of great um, sessions coming up, and then we have a number of others that we'll be um, confirming right now and we'll be announcing soon. Um, so thank everyone for joining us. Uh, the recording will be posted uh, in the next 24 to 48 hours. And again, I really want to thank Kevin um, and Takachar for being here with us and congratulations to them on, on winning the, uh, the XPRIZE Milestone Award and um, for all the great work they're doing. Everyone be well and we will see you next week.